Hi guys, this is Marius from Trademate Sports and with me today I have Andrew Beasley who is a football writer. He's been writing for a bunch of different blogs within the betting industry, the football industry. Uh, we're talking the official Liverpool site. Uh, he's been writing for Pinnacle Sports, for CBS and I'm sure there's a lot of other sites there too. Uh, so, pleasure to have you here, Andrew, and uh, yeah, I don't know if you have anything else to, to add sort of about uh, your background and uh, what you've been doing. Yeah, that's a pretty good summary. Um, yeah, I sort of work freelance for a whole host of different places, um, the ones you've listed, um, and then places like Paddy Power and Cloudbet and Gambling.com and all those, all those things, and then various sort of um, Liverpool um fan sites tomkins times i've done stuff for this is anfield wrote for the anfield rap anfield index way back when so yeah um lots of different places you know when you freelance it's good to write for as many different places as you can really yeah give you more legs to stand on and uh, diversify the, the income and everything plus getting more yeah. income i guess too so that's nice yes exactly, yeah all right, so I figured we would kick things off with uh, with talking a bit about uh, the coronavirus and the status of uh, of Premier League, since that's uh, pretty much on the agenda these days with all football games, uh, with the few exceptions of some very obscure leagues around the world being on pause. So uh, yeah, any any initial comments on like the the Premier League's plans to uh, to resume uh, the action on the thirtieth of April? Um, I think it's hard to see that it will actually happen. Then I, I can see why they want to put a sort of target date uh, in place, but I can't see that it's probably going to happen then. Um, obviously, as a Liverpool fan, as we've said, I mean I'm a bit biased in that I want the season to finish properly so they can. Um, so they can win the league. Um, it would be a shame if it all got sort of wiped from the history books if uh, they didn't finish the season. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't expect it to actually happen at the end of April. I think it'd be more like, I don't know, June, July, something like that. But uh, as long as it gets finished, uh, that's the main thing. Yeah, I very much agree with that. And uh, and yeah, I also think like April 30th is going to be way too soon. There's still going to be like restrictions on people. Uh, the government's asking people to remain indoors and everything to stop the the virus and stuff from spreading. And I just can't really see uh, footballers running around out there on the grass fields uh, competing. Because what happens if one of them has the infection and another player gets sick and he then uh, like transfers the 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 virus to someone else again? It's just so many like bad things that that can happen from all of that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even if they suggested um, playing all the games behind closed doors, um, which I don't think is a great idea, but if that's what they went for, probably better to just put a, port, a permanent pause, if that's a thing, on it and um, start properly when fans can attend the games and everything's OK. Yeah. Um, I think it would be for the best. So you would prefer for the games to wait all until like people can get into the stands again? You wouldn't want to play it behind closed doors? Not ideally, no, because I think, you know, football is all about the fans and, and being there. I think, it, you know, it would be quite sad for Liverpool if they won the league now in an empty stadium, um, although I'm sure they'd take that over not at all. But, yeah, I think and, and it would be a great sort of lift for everybody to be able to go to football again. So um, I'd prefer to see it wait until uh, fans can actually attend the matches. But I guess they'll have to see how long it all goes on for. Yeah, I, I guess that's a big factor in it, like whether it's one month, two months, six months, or like a year. I'm, I'm definitely in the camp that I would prefer the games to being played behind closed doors over not being played at all or being played in a very, very long time from now. And looking at like the economics of everything, I, I totally understand like the fan part and for the players it's much more fun to be playing when there are fans cheering on in, in this in the stadium and I totally yeah. understand that fans want to watch the games live, especially if they bought the ticket and everything. But looking at like the where the money from especially the Premier League clubs are coming from, the majority of it is from T V money. Um so like Overall, I, I still think it's a better solution if one is able to get started sooner and playing games behind closed doors. 
um, but of course it needs to be like practical and I don't know if the, the solution is to ship all of the players plus the support staff off to some remote island where they build like football fields and then have them play out the games in complete isolation over like two months. Uh, but uh, I, I personally would like rather prefer them trying stuff like that if it means the season can finish like two months, uh, months earlier. But I, I guess in the end we'll just uh, just have to see. Yeah, absolutely. No, I don't think anyone really knows quite how it's going to play out at this point. Yeah, it's uh, crazy, crazy times, that's for sure. And at least I'm very glad that they've taken a stance now and saying that the current season has to finish. Um, yeah. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, cancelling it just would cause so many problems. And I can't really see any good arguments for why you would sort of cancel the current season or just pause it where it is and then in order to like start the next season sooner because uh, if they are worried about like not finishing the next season let's say by june or whatever before the euros is normal uh, there's still so many changes that they could make to that tournament in in advance so that everyone like knows about the rules and agrees to them they could yeah. have playoffs they could like play only against uh, each team once and then split the league in two and like top teams play top 10 sides and bottom 10 sides play bottom 10 sides so so many like iterations to just make it work and have that sort of be like the, the special season and this one just wrapping up as uh, as normal yeah so when you do your football analysis are you which sort of tools are you using are you using excel python or anything else um, just Excel, really. I mean, it, it, it's probably quite basic by um, by a lot of people's standards. But um, you know, I just need sort of spreadsheets and, and formulas, and, and that'll do that'll do sort of what I need it to um, for the sort of things that I'm looking to write about. Um, with hindsight, I probably wish I had learned uh, things like Python and R. And it, but obviously, it's not too late. But um, I've sort of established that I'm okay with what I'm doing, so I'll sort of probably stick to that. To be honest, yeah. Um, me personally, I have been doing uh, some uh, like data science work in uh, in Python on like my free time, um, and with Excel, the the advantage is that there are a lot of very simple operations that's done with like a couple of clicks and uh, and writing in uh, some formulas and stuff like that. Um, so there are some like basic stuff that at least in the beginning takes longer time to do in Python. But like after a little bit, I at least feel it gives me so much more freedom uh, to do things with with the data. While within yeah. Excel, it's more more like constrained, um, and it doesn't it really doesn't take too long to sort of uh, get what you want out of the data. So I, I would definitely like recommend at least uh, giving it a shot. But yeah. Well, I've probably got time now because there's less, uh, there's no sort of football previews to write. So I've probably got time to learn it now. Yeah. Maybe I should. Perfect timing. One always needs to uh, take the uh, the bad times in the world and uh, see, look for the opportunities in it. I yeah, guess that's uh, absolutely. That's the lesson. Um, do you have any tips for beginners who want to get started doing their own football analysis? I think really, I mean, it's probably true of anything. It's say the same if anyone wants to write about football. All the, just the best thing is to sort of practice and do as much as you, as much as you can. I mean, I, I was probably quite lucky in that when I started doing um, statistical analysis of football, it was it was quite um, it was quite a new thing. No, not many people were sort of doing it, so I was sort of able to to sort of get in at the at the ground floor when when lots of people were starting, and. Um, Obviously, lots of people have advanced far beyond what I can do now, but um, I think it was certainly of, of a benefit to me when it was just a hobby that it was, um, as I say, it was still quite a new thing. Um, so really, yeah, I mean, it's just a case of um, trying and, and practicing and, and sort of doing what you want. I mean, I suppose the advantage now is there are at least lots of things out there that you can copy effectively to get started and see what people have done in the past, and, and you might have an idea that, that better than someone's done before but you've at least got something to uh to learn from but um practice is 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 what did it for me and, and i'm sure would work for most people yeah yeah uh, it's like uh, the the side project i got going on these days is uh, like building my own fantasy football model okay and, uh, that's that's basically just uh i want to learn some more uh, data science uh things in, in python and then 
doing it on football data is just so much more fun than uh, yeah. trying to predict uh, I don't know uh, housing rates or, uh, yeah, <laughs> or yeah. things like that. So when you just see the the names of the players and everything and uh, start to dig a bit into the numbers, it's uh, it's very very fun. Yeah. Um, what are the most important things that you have learned with regards to like the, doing the analysis that you wish you knew when you got started? Um, I'm not sure really if anything sort of springs to mind. I think it's all um, sort of carrying on from the last question, I suppose. But the sort of process of, of learning is 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 part of it. You know, I think um, making mistakes along the way is is fine it's probably it's probably a good thing almost um so i suppose i mean i'm i wasn't very good on excel at all when i started i mean i'm better if i knew what i knew about excel when i started i'd have probably got things done quicker even though excel is quite basic i've still learned so much about how to use it in the in the time i've been doing it so even better excel uh, skills would have been uh, would have been handy to begin with but um I mean, I can only speak from my own experience, and I think you know, mistakes and, and learning along the way has, has has been great anyway. So, you know, it's it's all it's all been useful in its way. What are some good data sources that are out there and available uh, for people to use and free uh, if they want to, or either free or very cheap uh, if they want to <laughs> go about like whether it's creating their own betting models or making their own fantasy model? Uh, what sort of places would you go looking for data? Um, certainly, if you're interested in teams and um, their expected goals, then the best place to go to is, is 538 because they have data on lots of different leagues and when matches are actually happening, obviously not now, um, it updates pretty quickly, almost immediately, and you can download their spreadsheet, which has got over 10,000 matches on. Hmm. So you can do a lot of, and that's completely free, and you can do a lot of research then, obviously, on about how often teams with the most expected goals win or what's a sort of reasonable margin to say a team deserved to win a game and all these sorts of things. So if you're interested in sort of team performance, then 538's um, database, which is free and downloadable, is is great. Um, uh, if you're more interested in player statistics, um, probably um, Understat is a good one, uh, which has the top five leagues in Europe. And all of the players' expected goals um, by match and by different sort of um, scenarios and team scenarios, how they do on counter attacks and quick breaks and inside the box and outside the box, all these sorts of things. Um, and another good one, uh, certainly for Premier League players to do with fantasy football, is uh, Fantasy Football Scout, mm. which is not free, but I think is maybe £15 a year, so it's pretty cheap. Um, and that's got lots of uh, cool player stats on and you can um, create your own tables and things to look for. Um, I sort of mentioned earlier, you know, players who haven't scored in the last few weeks but have had a lot of good chances. You can make yourself a table so it will automatically show you who those guys are and stuff like that. So um, that, that's another good resource, probably um, pretty good for, for fantasy football. All right. That's very cool to hear. No, I didn't know about the um, the 538 uh, that it was downloadable because obviously, like I, whenever I f want to know the expected goals of a game, I either go to there or on the stat and have a look. Especially like uh, right after the Liverpool Atletico game, it was like straight in there and see if, <laughs> what yeah. did the numbers actually look like after this. Um, but yeah, it's very cool that it's uh, it's downloadable too. Yeah, I'll send you the link after this. All right, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Yeah, because I, I think you also, I, I wrote one of your, no, I read <laughs> one of your articles for uh, Tonkin's Times, and there you mentioned a site called fbref.com. Um, oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I thought that one was pretty cool, because they also had already done some calculations on, like, I guess it was uh, goals per minute and all those sort of things that you typically don't see on, like, the average, um, the average, like, football historical stats for players going back multiple seasons so I just uh, I found that to be, uh, be a pretty interesting source that I'm definitely gonna have a closer look at myself um, yeah I haven't used that much myself but it is quite interesting because it uses stats bomb data rather than opta data so it's interesting yeah. to sort of look at you know another side of things 
that, that's where they are getting their data from. Uh, certainly, their expected gold data and stuff. Yeah, it's all oh. stats bombs. Right. Yeah. Right. Rather than others. So um, it's always interesting to sort of check out new models and see what's going on and stuff like that. So yeah, yeah, definitely worth. I, I need to look into that more myself, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool because uh, I uh, try to listen to every episode of uh, of Stats Bomb. Uh, really big yeah. fan of all of their work and uh, that sort of if I. Uh, if I could get my hands on uh, one set of data, I'd want to uh, to get into uh, into the data that uh, that they have because uh, the things they are doing, yeah, they're basically creating more in-depth metrics than what a lot of the bigger providers like Opta, etc., have when they're looking at not just like expected goals based on like the shot location, but also uh, looking into uh, how much pressure was the player on when he took the shot, uh, how was the goalkeeper positioned. What happened after the shot was taken, things like that. Uh, I think there was like an article on, on post shot expected goals, uh, where mm -hmm. Liverpool looked totally different than if you just looked at their regular expected goals. So, yeah, very interesting to see. Um, do you have any books uh, to recommend for people about like football analysis? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've read quite a few over the years. Um, the, I mean, they're all they're all very well known, to be fair. But um, the numbers game uh, is very good by Anderson and Sally. Um, uh, David Sumter's book, uh, Soccer Matics, is really good. Yeah. Um, and uh, Joseph, who we've talked about, he's written some books. I've only I've only got one of them quite recently, and I've sort of started it, but. Um, Certainly, he's written some some books on betting, which I'm sure will be uh, will be worth checking out. All right. Any other resources besides uh, books that uh, are good to check out? I suppose really, it's just uh, it would be good uh, if someone's sort of starting out again, just to sort of read as much as they can. Lots of very good articles on um, Statsbomb's site if you want to learn about sort of football analysis and stuff. Um, if you're interested in uh, betting then pinnacle do a lot of articles some of which i've written obviously i have to say that but uh, uh, they do lots of good articles on um you know how to be a smarter um better and things like that so they've uh, they've got resources there so uh, you know, obviously I promote that a little bit but um yeah they've got some good stuff yeah i think in terms of um, bookmaker blogs then the only one i consider worth reading is uh, is pinnacles um, because they are actually they want the the winning players they don't kick them out like the major European bookmakers do so yeah. they're actually incentivized to sort of give actual good info and not a lot of misinformation which uh, unfortunately is uh, is so spread out in, in the entire betting industry and sort of why I think that's part of uh, of why they uh, they have gotten like a bad rumor in uh, in general is because they they try to take like shortcuts and uh, rather rather mislead than uh, than inform yeah. uh, the punters and uh, yeah I'm not not too big fan of that approach but I like Pinnacle's blog at least they they have some good resources in there yes definitely all right have you uh, ever worked with like any football clubs or anything like that or has it just been like media sites that's been the the yeah source. Yeah, just just media sites. I mean, I've I've um, I've written for like the Liverpool website, but I mean, I've not sort of worked with them in any sort of analysis sense. No. Yeah. Uh, let's move on and uh, talk a bit about uh, Liverpool. So, Liverpool very much appear to be at the the forefront of applying data science to improve team performance. And I read uh, like one of the latest uh, the latest article I guess you did for Tompkins Times. Uh, we looked. What was it? You looked into which players were like the most important for the performance. Yep. Um, they also like mentioned an article uh, which wrote about Dr. Ian Graham, who's like the director of research at Liverpool. Uh, found that one very very interesting, and I don't know if you can give like the the listeners a very quick like summary of uh, of what that article is is about and sort of what Liverpool have been doing behind the scenes. Yeah, so um, Ian Graham basically uh, has what they call a, a goal probability model. So what it does is analyzes every decision a player makes. So if they make a pass, if they make a tackle, if they make a dribble, basically looks at is that um, improving the team's chance of scoring a goal? Because obviously, um, you know, if you 
win the ball back high up the pitch, it will make a bigger difference than winning the ball back in your own third of the pitch. I mean, that's basic. and you know, it's, it's far more in-depth than that, but that's basically what it's saying, is every action that a player does is that helping their team or increasing the likelihood their team will score a goal. Now, what his model found basically was that Nabi Keita was uh, a bit of a superstar. And so he pushed for him to uh, be signed by the club, which they did. Um, it's not worked out all that well for him. He's had quite a lot of injuries and things like that. But, you know, the, the sort of um, the logic in buying the player seems sound. And then the very simple analysis I did uh, via the uh, FB ref site we were talking about uh, looks at whether the team's expected goals is higher or lower with each player on the pitch. And again, Nabi Keita comes up really well on this. So although it's nowhere near as in-depth as what Ian Graham is doing, it's basically coming to a similar conclusion of the team plays better when Nabi Keita plays. Yeah. Um, so that's the sort of thing that, uh, that he's doing. And uh, obviously Liverpool have as well as him, other guys, um, somebody who was working with the um, Hadron Collider and stuff like this, you know, real um, top-level sort of physicists working on this kind of stuff. And um, I'd, I've been lucky enough to meet them a few times at um, the Opta Pro Forum, yeah, the cool. event Opta runs once a year. I, I, I have met the guys from Liverpool, and they're all really nice. You know, what they're doing is, is probably way beyond what, you know, 99% of people analysing football are, are doing because they're, Sort of, you know, that's the sort of level they can work at. But um, yeah. it's really interesting stuff. But uh, yeah, I, I wouldn't be able to do what they're doing anywhere, anything like anywhere close to what they're doing. I don't think. Yeah, it's like on the one hand side, I'm incredibly glad that Liverpool have these people working on working for them. At the same time, I know just there goes my chance at uh, being a data <laughs> analyst for for Liverpool. But I mean, I've been prioritizing differently, uh, differently, anyways. But uh, you can yeah. always always have the dreams. Um, but yeah, no, I, I think it's pretty, pretty incredible to see, and um, I don't, I, I think maybe I, I posted like a, a link to it in like the the show notes I sent you. But um, there's also another article that I read, uh, which was about the work that they've been doing, like showing some examples of uh, how they're looking at like pitch control, and. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll put a, I put the link in the show notes um, below the YouTube video, uh, but essentially what it's about is they are for every player you can imagine they have like lots of circles around them, and that shows how likely that player is to reach a certain area of the pitch uh, the fastest. Yeah. And so essentially you sort of run this over time, and you can see at all times like which player will reach which part of the field, and it kind of uh, it kind of takes football and moves it in the more the direction of chess I think because then it's about like how can you create like an yeah, overload in these zones and make sure that you're exploiting like the space that's uh, being left there and I'm just I would love to be a fly on the wall uh, between uh, Graham and Klopp's meetings to see how much of this is actually uh, taken and like put into action uh, with the players because obviously by the time they are, uh, this information is reaching the players, it's more like you should do this. You should put in a crosshair, play a long pass there, rather than showing them like the big uh, statistical yeah. model output. Um, so yeah, it would be very fascinating to see like how much of it is implemented in practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and yeah, uh, back to uh, back to Nabi Keita again because I remember, like as I mentioned, like I listened to the Stats Pro podcast, and I remember back in the days when uh, I, I can't remember if it was when he was still in Salzburg or whether he had uh, just gone to Leipzig. I think it was uh, actually when he was in Salzburg, and they were talking about which players Arsenal should sign for midfield. And uh, the answer, whether you wanted a defensive midfielder, central midfielder, or attacking midfielder, was Nabi Keita, Nabi Keita, Nabi Keita. Uh, yeah. So it's not like only Dr. Graham that's uh, seen the data on him and decided that he's a very, very special player. And it's very yeah. sad that injuries have, uh, have been so bad so far, uh, because that's one of the things that are very difficult to, to plan for, especially when their injury record looks completely fine before they signed. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess we just need to keep our fingers crossed and hope he gets more chances to to show all the fans what he can do. 
um, because at least um, what what I think when he is playing is that he gives another dimension to the midfield and that he's able to uh, to move the ball past the line. And uh, yeah, I'll be very interested to see uh, the stats on that because I really feel like his acceleration enables him to just like run past players and. Uh, and yeah, not not everyone in the midfield are are able to uh, to do that. So no, definitely not. Yeah, it would be great if he could get a proper good run in the team and uh, show what he can really do. Because I think he's done it in sort of bit bursts here and there. But yeah, real sustained would be really good. Yeah, because I'd be very interested to see like whether Klopp would ever like start both Keita and Ox at the same time. Because I, I think those are the two players which sort of have that skill of bypassing um, a line just by running uh, in, in like their locker. Reginaldo, as much as I love him, and uh, and Henderson, they don't really have enough pace to, to do that. Uh, so it would just yeah. be very interesting to see like Fabinho uh, in the holding role and, and those two seeing like what they could accomplish. But maybe it's sufficient for like the balance of the midfield and everything to just have one of them in at the same time. So, are there any elements of uh, of Liverpool's play that you think, if you were to guess, um, that you think would be derived from the analytics department? I'm not sure about derived from the analytics department. I know that um, <clears throat> Klopp said that uh, a couple of years ago Liverpool were one of the worst teams at set pieces and now they're the best. So I think the analytics team must have helped with that how much of it was the analytics team going to Klopp and how much was Klopp going to the analytics team um, I guess we don't know but um, they've clearly improved on that because they weren't all that good and now they're they're very clearly the best so they have improved a lot of that and I think analytics can can play a big part in that um, beyond that I'm not really sure I think a lot of what they do it is more sort of looking at um, recruitment and things rather than um, you know match to match what they're sort of what they're sort of doing there. Um, but I think they're probably, yeah, focusing on recruitment because that's where the real money um, can be made, basically. Yeah. Definitely plays uh, such a huge, huge, it has such a huge impact on like how a team performs, not only over just one season, but over like five year, 10 year period. That's really the difference between whether you're stuck in mid table uh, trying to to claw your way away from relegation and uh, climb yourself up into like Europa League or Champions League spot, versus yeah. being out there and fighting for for titles every year, and especially with both Manchester City and uh, United plus a bunch of other teams, although that's even out a bit more, have had so much more money than Liverpool to buy players. You need to be smarter and uh, get better uh, return on investment on on the capital spent and over the since ever. Uh, Club came in and it's just been absolutely incredible with the signings they made. Yeah, absolutely. They've not really had a, anyone fail beyond maybe Carrius, but I mean, he was sort of four million. I mean, all of the sort of big money players have all done brilliantly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if one hadn't had that whole like Champions League final where he did get the concussion and all of that, and even if people doubt whether it was a concussion, there's no doubt that Sergio Ramos elbowed him in the head. Um, yeah. So it's like without that game, I thought he had a pretty good spring that year, and uh, and for me, like the biggest issue with him is that he's not the tallest of goalkeepers, and yeah. I think that you can get away with it in some other leagues, but in the Premier League, you need to be uh, tall, cool. otherwise you're always going to be at a disadvantage against uh, big central defenders and strikers and whatever you're playing against. And I think that's part of why Kepa has uh, struggled at Chelsea. It's because, yeah, he, he basically has less reach than, uh, than some of the other keepers in the league, despite his reflexes being fantastic. So, Yeah, you could be right. All right. So how would you describe Liverpool's uh, season so far? Well, it's not been bad, has it? I mean, it's uh, it's kind of unbelievable, really, that a team could win 27 out of... 29 games. I mean, as, as strange as the defeat at Watford was when they lost 3 0 and they were terrible, you know, they've, they've more or less deserved to win every game as well as winning every game. So, I mean, to be able to do that is it's just remarkable. I mean, it's only two years ago that um, Man City got 100 points and, and everyone said, well, that'll never happen again. And all right, we don't know at this point, but it seems likely Liverpool will get to 100 points because they're on. 
I've already forgotten, is it 85, 82 at the moment? Um, you know, chances are Liverpool will get to 100 as well. So, um, yeah. and, and they've probably deserved to. And then at the same time, they've gone out of the Champions League and, and you know, they lost at home to Atletico Madrid, even though it was one of their best performances for for quite a while. But I mean, I guess that's, that's how football goes and that's why we all love it is because it's, you know, it is sort of unpredictable in that way. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, the, the, the season so far has been incredible. It's better than anyone could ever imagined. And also could probably, will ever see again, you know, yeah. it's unlikely any team will do this. Liverpool or any team will win sort of 27 out of 29 games again. Um, so yeah, just lucky that it's sort of been my team, our team this uh, this time that's done it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean... It's sort of the. I'm very curious to see what happens with like the expectations and things that they are are setting now. In one way, I kind of view the um, the Atletico's setback as something positive, because it's definitely going to keep the the players hungry uh, for more Champions League glory next season, rather than if they had gotten to let's say a quarterfinal, semifinal, or even a final, and, and got knocked out. Now I think they're going to be very, very eager to prove that we weren't just lucky when we won it. Uh, we can do it again, and that uh, Atletico game was just yeah, just a big, uh, tiny blip on the radar in the end. And uh, yeah, it's the same with, uh, with the Watford game. I mean, any team has like a bad game over, uh, over the seasons, and for me, even though the Invincibles managed to yeah, be invincible like through an entire season and had a longer run than, than what Liverpool um, had, it's still like they played so many draws and football is about winning and it's all about points. So I, I still don't understand, I, I still don't think Liverpool get enough credit for just how good this team is, both in like the, the media and also amongst other uh, like neutral football fans. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, I think I think with the media, they're always sort of hanging on to see how it will end. So had Liverpool ended the season unbeaten, obviously they won't now, then they probably make a big deal of it then. Or if they get 105 points or whatever, they'll make a big deal of it then. I mean, I think um, I think your, fra- uh, your phrase neutral uh, football fans is probably, uh, is probably no such thing really as neutral because everyone either, you know, particularly with the big teams, you know, I think people either like Liverpool or they don't like them or they like Man City or they don't like them, you know. So, um, yeah, I'm not sure there's such a thing as, as neutral fans, but um, I think I think people are sort of will respect the achievement when the, when the season finally finishes. But I, I think, um, you know, it, it's easier to call Liverpool one of the best teams ever if they were still in the FA Cup or Champions League. And because they've gone out of them, that sort of brings it down a bit. But... Um, no, I'm sure at the end of the season they'll get they'll get all the sort of plaudits they deserve, but maybe not from, you know, fans of other clubs necessarily. But um, yeah, they, uh, they they they'll they'll get the credit, I think. Yeah, because because um, at, at least to me, I mean, we'll see where like how many points they end up with in the end, and whether sort of the narrative and everything changes. But I'm I'm part of like a, a fantasy group where there are some some players who are ranked amongst like the best fantasy Premier League managers like ever right. and even there it was kind of like there was someone saying is this one of the best teams in the Premier League uh, ever or like in general football ever and one of the, like top ranked managers in fantasy football which I assume should be like a reasonable person because you kind of need to be a bit uh, stats updated and stuff to uh, to do that well in fantasy it was like not a chance uh, remember this team and that team and I just don't understand how it's possible when looking at the numbers and looking at 20, uh, 27 games and 25 wins and one draw and one loss. But, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Well, like I say, no such thing as a neutral. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's probably, as, I don't know which team he supports. If it's Manchester United, then I guess that uh, all of it is, uh, is explained. Yeah. I would explain it. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we talked a bit about Atletico, but, yeah, to me, in the end, that was... Uh, I'm not sure if I if I want to say like most uh, uh, since Atletico did score three goals in the end, I can't really say it's like the most undeserved uh, result I know of in uh, in football. Uh, but uh, yeah, just it's so much fantastic play and so little like uh, output in the end for for Liverpool. And uh, yeah, it's just 
you have some of those games and I think the side put in an absolutely incredible effort and they did all they could. It wasn't good enough, uh, no shame in that and even though some people will like blame the, the goalkeeper and everything, one has to remember he's the reserve goalkeeper and yeah. any team is going to have a, a drop off uh, when they're playing their uh, second choice uh, goalkeeper instead of the first choice so that's sort of how it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, so my, my next question then is, do you think that the current Liverpool side is one of the best teams in football history? Uh, I mean, they, they can make a case purely on the basis of their record. Um, I don't know if you're aware of a website called Club E, which uses um, the ELO system to uh, sort of assess how strong teams are. Mm-hmm. They have the current Liverpool side as the fourth best team ever, yeah. um, which... Um, whether you agree or not, I mean, it, it sort of makes sense when they've won as many games as they have. Uh, they've been to two Champions League finals in the, in the previous two seasons, beaten some good teams on the way. So, I mean, in, purely in terms of their record and the number of points they've won, then they have to be considered one of the best teams. Now, of course, people take a lot of things. When people make that, you know, they will look at um, trophies won and perhaps style of football and things like that. I mean, on trophies, one, they're probably not one of the best teams of all time. But when you look at their record, the amount of games they've won in the last two years and the quality of teams they've beaten, then, I mean, they deserve to be in the conversation for for one of the best teams, certainly. Yeah, I mean, I agree. And it's like always when we look at the best teams in the past, then you've sort of seen the entire like lifespan of that team. So you sort of know how it plays out. And who knows what we will be talking about in, in five years. Maybe we won the league five times in a row and the Champions League uh, five times too. Um, I have my, my fingers crossed at least. And then there will be no doubt. But it's uh, it's e- even with like the, the trophies part, um, I, I still think there's a good argument for this team being better than even if they just win the league. Uh, than the Manchester United side in '99, which won the FA Cup and um, and the Champions League too. Yeah. Um, and that is purely based. On, I think they won with like 79 points or something. It was pretty low. And it's like in any other sport, if you because people say our oh, trophies is everything, but it's kind of like if you run the marathon at uh, four hours in uh, in 1999. And you win it, and then someone else runs it in three hours in 2020 and finishes yeah. second. Then to me, obviously, they're a better runner. And yeah. uh, maybe maybe it was because they had better shoes or better players. But but still, like uh, it is like a, a bigger achievement to me. And at least for for football, players are getting more fit. They're using data science for everything now, and. Uh, the pace in the game and everything is higher. There are like actual like stats that back this up. So for every year that goes, like the level is higher. It's tougher to to perform. So if you're able to then stand out against all of that competition, then at least that makes uh, makes you yeah better than uh, than what was in the past. But yeah, maybe maybe some people. I mean, it's also not totally fair if one was comparing like uh, footballers from one time period versus the next because you can only beat the players or the team that's in front of you so it's not like Pele's fault that he was no, born in no. uh, in like uh, played during like the 50s and 60s or whatever uh, compared to like Messi who's playing now but maybe he would have been better than Messi if he was playing today so who knows Yeah, I always say that uh, I want to see how this plays out because I, I don't feel safe that Manchester City will actually be uh, banned from the Champions League uh, for, for two seasons but given that it is upheld how do you think that will affect the, the race for the Premier League titles over the next couple of seasons? Well, it will certainly um, be in Manchester City's favour with the view of winning the Premier League if they're not playing European football. Um, although, I say that, I suppose a lot depends on if they can keep their players and uh, replace the sort of ageing guys they've got with with sort of bet, uh, equally good sort of young players. But you'd have to think that it would give them an advantage in, in trying to win the league and it would be harder for for Liverpool to win the league if they're still playing European football. I mean, certainly, well, as we're recording this, who knows when next season will start or what will happen, but let's just assume that it, that it sort of happens. 
there's the African Cup of Nations, which will affect Liverpool mm. if uh, Salah and Mane go to that. Uh, Keita as well, potentially. So, um, yeah, it will be very tough for Liverpool to win the league if Manchester City are out of Europe. As much as Liverpool fans will enjoy Manchester City being out of Europe, it will probably make the league harder, yeah. Yeah, because I, w- I was actually, because up until, I guess, yesterday when I, like... Uh... Uh, thought that that would be a good question to ask. I, I've always thought that you know this is going to be absolutely great because uh, then they're not going to be in the fight for the Champions League. But the point you're making about it, uh, it making it more difficult in the Premier League, it might actually be be a bad thing for uh, for Liverpool if if they are yeah. not, because uh, then they're competing uh, on fewer fronts, can have more rested players every week, and with the, the squad and the money they have. And yeah, they probably won't even need to rotate and can start like their best uh, fullbacks in every game. But it's going to be interesting yeah. to see. Like, I can imagine some players uh, wanting out if they do stay banned for two years. And it's just going to be interesting to see also what happens with Guardiola because b- big part of his motivation is obviously uh, winning the Champions League. And if he knows he can't do it for two years, is he then? going to try his luck somewhere else. He usually, yeah, coaches for a couple of years, then takes a sabbatical uh, anyway, so maybe that will be, like, a natural time to end it. Especially if they do end up, like, winning the Champions League uh, this year in the end, which they have pretty good chances of doing with Liverpool being out, assuming it is finished. Um, So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see, at least. Which transfers do you expect Liverpool to make this summer, both in and out? Well, in terms of uh, coming in, it would be good if they could get somebody high quality to rotate with the front three. Um, been lots of talk about Timo Werner, maybe someone like him, um, because as much as someone like um, Origi is a, is a sort of cult hero for what he's achieved at Liverpool, he's obviously a bit of a step down if he's sort of filling in for one of the uh, for one of the, the main guys up front. So I think somebody, some real good quality uh, competition there. Uh, would, would be my priority. Um, in terms of going out, I mean, I think some of the guys who've been around a long time, uh, Lalana, you know, Lovren, people like that will probably leave. I don't think Liverpool will be looking to sell any of their sort of key players and I can't imagine any of them would want to leave. So um, I think it'd be good to, yeah, get some good play, a couple of good players in to sort of freshen things up. I don't think anyone that important is going to leave. The the good thing they've got is that the majority of their key players are of a sort of decent age. They're not um, sort of at the end of their careers. I mean, you know, Milner possibly, but uh, most of the guys are still sort of mid to late twenties. So um, they can sort of freshen it up, retain the bulk of the uh, main sort of starting eleven. Then um, should be able to have another good season next year. Yeah, if yeah. I mean, if they're able to free up uh, the stock of Shakiri going for like twenty million, they're able to do that. Um, move upgrades from Origi to Werner because I, I like Origi but uh, but yeah the, the games this season he hasn't had as much of an impact I was very surprised that he wasn't given more chances especially like during the Christmas period and in times when there were a lot of games played in a short period of time I, I would have uh, imagined that based on the season he had last year that he would be getting more shots, but I guess Klopp uh, sees him in training every day and sees Mane and Salah in training every day and decided that's the best way to go about it and one can't really complain with the output. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah. Um, and then Lovren, I mean, I, I don't think he's uh, he's been... I think he's been all right for like the, the last... Two years, definitely. Um, he still has that odd mistake in him, which uh, often comes at the wrong time and ends up like costing points. So I think it would be nice if one is able to cash in some money before he gets even older or his contract runs out, so that yeah. one is able to like reinvest that money. Um, but I mean, he's for choice like right now, so it's not like a, a big, big deal either way. It's uh, yeah. also difficult for the kind of money you would get for him to get in someone who's better. Um, unless you buy someone young, or uh, it's probably maybe a bit too early to give uh, give the young guys like uh, Sepp uh, Vandenberg and uh, maybe also Kijana Hoover uh, like the fourth yeah. uh, fourth choice shot. Uh, I guess we'll see what uh, what club thinks. And then we'll. I'm also very interested to see what happens with Harry Wilson. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's six or seven goals he's got in the Premier League so far this season, but 
being able to to do that for a team uh, which is battling relegation I'd be very interested to see just like what he's able to do if he was uh, given a chance to play with uh, with Firmino and uh, and Mane yeah definitely um, so yeah but uh, in, in Cup we trust I guess and uh, absolutely yes yeah. it's, uh, it's actually I think the team is so good overall now that I'm I'm glad I'm not the manager because it's so in the past years, it will always be, yeah, we need to do this, this, and that, and then the team is fixed, but now it's just impossible, uh, really, to uh, to determine. And uh, if uh, if Lallana goes, I I would very much like us to to see, like, whether it's like Havertz or uh, Sancho coming in on the wing. Uh, I, I'd love to see one more player come in, in addition to Werner, to try and, like, bring in real competition for the the first team spaces yeah. and the, the the players are so good that it's difficult to to find people who are better than them without needing to spend um, either very smart money on very young players or spend uh, spend big money on some of like the called generational like potential talents and, and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, do you play fantasy football yourself? No, I have in the past. I, I sort of used to quite a few years ago. And then when I, my sort of hobby became writing about football, just running my little blog, that kind of took over. And I wasn't sort of having the time to think about who to um, transfer in and out on fantasy. So I sort of stopped playing it uh, quite a few years ago, yeah. All right, too bad. I, uh, I guess you, uh, you could have done, uh, done pretty good at it. Uh, but it, it is uh, pretty time-consuming. I, yeah. uh, I try to... Do things rather efficiently. Like uh, I'm doing okay, but if I wanted to do better, I probably need to spend a lot, lot more time in order to uh, to really like get those extra points. So, yeah. uh, so for me, as, as long as I'm beating my uh, my closest friends, then uh, then I'm happy. Then I have the the bragging rights, and uh, I guess yeah. we'll see. My goal is to have uh, have the model I'm working on ready for next season. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, it's it's mainly just for for fun and to learn some new skills. So yeah, we'll see how whether it's able to beat the other guys out there in the end. So let's talk a bit about like what it's like writing about football, because uh, I can imagine for a lot of people, just working with football in in some way is like the dream. Like me myself, uh, working with TradeMate, it's close to uh, close to football. Um, mm -hmm. It's on the betting side, but but still. It's uh, a lot of fun and uh, just being it's kind of related to football in some way. And I mean, yeah. you, you've been writing for the official Liverpool side, for the Echo, uh, for a bunch of companies within uh, both sports media and the gambling industry. Uh, so what is it like to, to work as a freelance football writer? Uh, well, it's great normally uh, when there's football on. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it, it is good. Um, obviously, get to you know work from home, work when I like. Uh, because previously to this, I used to work um, for a bank, sort of nine to five job. So um, and it, it was fine, but I didn't particularly enjoy it. So th this is obviously a lot better. Um, but obviously, you are sort of reliant upon there being football and things, and you, you sort of soon uh, you, you can s sort of struggle in the current um, you know issues with coronavirus and things, but. It will pass eventually and um, get back to it and stuff. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, if you can get into it, then, yeah, it is great, yeah. So what was that decision like where you just one day, yeah, now I'm, uh, I'm leaving banking behind and uh, starting football writing? Or did, did it start, like, part-time and then it's, like, eventually <laughs> took over? No, what, well, as I, as I sort of said, I was, um, I was sort of writing about football as a hobby when I worked at the bank. And then uh, the bank uh, actually made me redundant. Mm -hmm. And when they did so, they gave me um, a, a decent payout. So I could afford to not have to find another job immediately. Yeah. So it was at that point that I thought, well, I, I may as well try while I've got this opportunity to see if I can go freelance as a writer. And, and fortunately, I've managed to sort of do it to build up enough um, things to, to be able to do it. But... Um, I, I did have a bit of money behind me when I started. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been brave enough to just sort of quit the bank and start. Best thing that uh, best thing that ever happened to me. I'm, I'm glad it did. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not sure I'd, I'd have just gone for it um, off my own back. It was it was good to have some money so that I could take a bit of time to sort of get established. Yeah. Uh, so I love it. It's taking an obstacle that gets into the way and being able to 
to take the opportunity that, that arises. So I think that's uh, that's very cool and uh, awesome to hear that uh, it's the best thing ever. <laughs> yes, so. absolutely. Um, yeah, so one of the, the other questions I have is, is it tough to find like jobs um, within football writing? Um, I think it can be. I mean, I, I was um, <clears throat> quite lucky, I suppose, in a way. Like, I was already writing stuff for Tomkins Times when it was just a hobby. Mm-hmm. Um, and they then um, sort of took me on as a paid writer, doing bits and bobs for them. Um, as with a lot of things, it's sort of who you know. Um, somebody I know um, works for Paddy Power, mm-hmm. and he asked me if I'd be interested in writing for them. So I was like, yes, of course. So I started writing for them. And I think then uh, once you write for one thing, then I got, got approached from other um, betting companies and things like that. Um, so um, I, I think it's quite tough to find gigs uh, off your own back, just a- approaching people because, as I say, people go with people they know, people they like. So, um, But certainly once having had good opportunities, I think it could then, it's then easier to build it up from there once you, once you get a start. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. It's uh, it's always like the seems like the old saying is true that uh, it's important to you know. So uh, yes, absolutely. No, it it definitely is. Yeah. Hmm. All right. So I mean, you don't need to say exactly what you're paying, but uh, w- what sort of the ballpark range that people are willing to pay for an article? Well, it's quite interesting because I think it's one of those things where nobody sort of really knows how much to pay because some places will offer you uh some money uh well obviously a lot of your money offer you what you consider fair some will be um a fair way below that some will be uh quite a bit more than that and you just sort of have to take what what you can sort of get really um for instance uh without sort of give, giving the exact figures but you know something like uh the liverpool echo doesn't pay me as much as some other things do but it's it's good to write for them because so many Liverpool fans read it and it's good for mm-hmm. sort of profile and things like that. So, you know, I might not earn quite as much from it, but it, it, it's sort of good in other ways. Yeah, it gives um, you exposure. But, but, it, but it is quite interesting because I've also worked um, as, a, as an editor for um, uh, 12 football. And again, people were earning different amounts for that and some were earning less than what I would write for, but they were happy to accept it. So I, I think it, it's an interesting... Um, industry and that i'm not sure anyone really knows how much to charge or or, or what a fair price is i mean i'm earning enough to 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 sort of live on and to do what i want to do so for me that's that's fine you know i could i'm sort of established now maybe i could put my prices up but if all the people i'm saying i'm writing for say well no we're not going to pay that then you know yeah it's all supply and demand i guess but it's um, uh, it's tricky i guess one uh one needs to sort of uh Try a bit in one end, and then keep the same price uh, with the others, and, uh, and exactly then see. Because yeah. then you sort of you got your risks covered, but you can still angle. And then if those accept like the higher price, then you can sort of go to like the next and, uh, and sort of like take them one by one rather than going to all at once and uh, say I-, I want more money than uh, all of them. Yeah, say okay, then uh, we'll find someone else. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the good thing now, at least, is that if somebody new approaches me, I can sort of aim my price higher because if they say no, I've I've already got my sort of established ones yeah. I work for. So yeah. if, if I'm offered new stuff, I can sort of probably aim a little bit higher. But um, certainly starting out, it, it's very difficult to sort of know um, what's a fair price and, and things like that. But um, yeah, sort of doing OK. That's the main thing. All right. That's cool. Um, yeah, so you cover a very wide range of topics. Uh, so to name a few of like the, the article titles that I found is The Influence of VAR on EPL Betting, uh, Which Players Make Liverpool Perform Better, The Story of the 1877 Louisville Grays Baseball Betting Scandal, and the Champions League odds picks projecting this season's Cinderella team that could follow Ajax or Tottenham. So... How do you decide on what to write about? Well, it sort of goes both ways, as in I might pitch an idea to somebody or they might say, um, can we have an article on whatever it may be? Mm-hmm. Um, so, for instance, yeah, that, that baseball one, I've, I've sort of fairly recently uh, started following baseball quite closely. And uh, 
the chap said, oh, you like baseball, do you want to write about this? And I was like, yeah, of course. I mean, I'll, I'll sort of try anything, really. Um, with uh, ones, say, for the Tompkins Times, like which players make Liverpool perform better, I mean, that was just my idea from looking on the website and seeing the data was there on the fbref.com mm. uh, site. Um, so it, it, it can be both things. Um, uh, but a, a big part of being freelance is you've got to be able to sort of think of these ideas and pitch them because... Mm. Um, a lot of these places are happy for you to write for them, but they won't come out to you and say, can you write about this? It's more yeah. you'll pitch an idea to them and hopefully they'll take it or they might say, well, no, we're not really interested in that, but would you like to do mm. this? Yeah. So um, I guess that, that, you know, sort of back to earlier, talking about advice and stuff, if you want to be a writer, you've got to be able to think of these ideas and find an angle that, that hopefully has not been covered somewhere else. Mm. Uh, just an example, I, I was um, I pitched an article about Newcastle having the uh, worst uh, statistics in the Premier League this season. And I sent an email off. And then before I'd had a reply, the Guardian had done an article basically on that. Mm. Now, I obviously didn't know that they were going to do that. But because they had, my idea then is, no, you know, they don't want the idea because like the Guardian's covered that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So you have to be able to have these ideas that, and hopefully ideas that nobody else has thought of um, and sort of, yeah, find your sort of niche to um, to sort of pitch those and, and get those picked up somewhere. Yeah, that's the newsworthiness uh, part of yes, it, I guess. Yeah, so yeah. I, I guess you should just uh, keep an eye out for whichever teams uh, significantly underperform next year and uh, beat the Guardian to it uh, for the next season. Yeah, I've got to get on them quicker than, uh, than I did this year, yeah. Yeah. So um, I'm actually very intrigued. Uh, if you can give like a brief summary of the Louisville Grace uh, baseball betting scandal. Okay, well, basically, um, the uh, National League, which is still running now um, in baseball, was formed in 1876. And the reason it was formed is that the sort of previous version of baseball before that was just riddled with corruption. So they wanted to start a new league and kind of put all that behind them. And uh, there was only eight teams in those days, and one of them were the, were the Louisville Grays. Um, but they, because obviously the baseball had been corrupt before, they were hiring players who had been corrupt before, essentially. Um, and so, yeah, they, they basically had four uh, guys on their team who were um, throwing matches. So um, very different sport to now, because now... Uh, baseball teams probably have like sort of five main pitchers who take it in turns mm. uh, to pitch a match. Um, but back then there was just one. They just had one pitcher, a guy called Jim Devlin. And so you could, if you could pay him off then to sort of pitch badly, he'd be doing it every game. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so basically, I mean, it's it pretty straightforward really, but basically they just had four guys who were accepting money from um, uh, bookies just to basically throw games. And they were, I think they were either top or joint top in the eight-team division. And then they lost 10 games out of 11 in a row and then finished second and then just started playing well again. So they didn't even sort of cover it up particularly well. It's sort of like, <laughs> we played really well, then we did really badly. Yeah. Uh, and then we started playing well again. But um, the Do, journalists the who were covering them... Sorry? Yeah, they got the odds uh, very high on the other team to win. <laughs> and, um... Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, the journalist who was covering them, he was suspicious and he started writing articles. And uh, somebody anonymously sent a telegram to the owner of the team. And he started sort of paying more attention. He was like, OK, there might be something in this. And um, it all just kind of, yeah, it all sort of came to light from there. So um, I pretty it's probably pretty basic from sort of modern standards, but I mean, it caused the team to just go out of business and the, the four guys were banned from baseball for life and stuff like this. So um, it, I think it's sort of uh, topical to look for other scandals uh, now that the Houston Astros have been found to be uh, stealing signs when they won the World Series a couple of years ago. So hmm. it's one of those articles that they sort of call evergreen. You know, it, it's sort of mildly topical now, but... You know, the articles stay there forever. It doesn't go out of date because yeah. it's about something that happened 150 years ago. But just an interesting little story. And it was, yeah, it's just fun to do something different because I'm so often writing about the next match or the last match. And here's something I had to read a book about and research properly rather than sort of slightly more superficial about, you know, a current game that's just happened or is going to happen and things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That makes, uh, makes sense. And also 
cool to do that. It's also something that we're always considering when we're like writing content, like whether it should be evergreen or more recent stuff. Um, so tricky balance. Uh, can't, st can't still say we have perfected that, uh, that <laughs> art. Um, do you ever like start out with the data? So you're just like doing some analysis and then saying, "Oh wow, this was interesting." Uh, that's and then you sort of get. I guess you mentioned that, and then you get like the idea, and you then you go pitch it. Yeah, it's normally, um, it might be something like if I'm messing around uh, looking at the numbers and things like that, like that example of the Newcastle article was because, you know, on the sort of expected goal stuff, you could argue they haven't deserved to win a game or season and yet they're safely in mid-table. You know, I've noticed that from just looking at an expected goal league table um, or it might be, um, you know, player stats like, um, uh, I mean, I haven't done this yet, but like Roberto Firmino hasn't scored at Anfield well he did against Atletico but he hasn't scored in the hasn't scored in the league at Anfield despite having about I think it's eight expected goals worth of chances so I might notice that and say okay well is that uh, is that just kind of random uh, is it poor finishing you know just trying to sort of investigate that a little bit so more often than not it will be just sort of looking at the data keeping the data up to date and just sort of saying okay maybe this is why is this happening or why is that happening or or what does that tell us you know it, it, it's more likely that because because I've been working with the data for a long time now, I sort of know what's there and what's not. You know, if I, I might have an idea about something else, but then I'll think, oh, I haven't got the data on that. So even if I've had the idea, I can't really look into it. You know, it's sort of spotting yeah. things in the data that I've got and then thinking, well, what can I write about that? You know? Mm. Yeah, we uh, we made like a list of uh, 10 top strikers, me and my colleague, uh, the other day, and we had the quite a, a first discussion about some of the rankings. We both agreed Firmino was in fourth place, I think. Okay. And uh, when I looked up the data there on Understat, he was second in the Premier League this season for expected goals, only yeah. beat by uh, Salah. So, uh, and then he's got eight goals. So it's kind of like, yeah. exactly like you said, he scored all the away goals, but none of the home goals. And, yeah, uh, and and do you think that's just uh, just did you look at like his, uh, his shots and stuff? Was it is it just randomness or or has his finishing yeah just been uh, been bad? Uh, well, I, I mean, who can say exactly? But I mean, he's certainly had quite a lot of um, high value chances. It is strange that he's um, that he hadn't scored from those chances. It's not like he's built up eight goals with you know, 100 shots from outside the box. He's had some very good chances, so it probably is just bad luck that he hasn't um, that he hasn't scored. But mm. I think these things always even them out over a, long, over a longer period. And, and a football season in sample terms isn't that long. It isn't that many games. I mean, yeah. if he doesn't score at Anfield in the league this season, assuming all the games get played, it's still only 19 games. It's not, it's not that many, really. You know, it's, these sort of random things happen. So... Um, you know, I don't. I don't think it makes him a bad player. It's just one of those strange things that that happens in in football. Yeah, yeah, it is. I uh, I totally want to see him continue playing, even if they if even if they buy Werner, I would very much like to uh, to see Cop experiment a bit with maybe a four two three one and drop Firmino back a notch because with his hard work, I'm I'm pretty sure he could fulfill like a, a deeper role. Um, anyways, and yeah, it would be very interesting to see. Worst case, you have like more flexibility, more options. You don't necessarily play that way every single game, but you have it sort of in in the locker and can pull it out when it's uh, needed. Yeah, no, definitely. All right. Um, does it uh, take any of the joy away from watching sport that you are also uh, working with it, or do you think everything is awesome? Uh -huh. No, I don't. I don't think it does particularly. I mean, um, interestingly, I think I think that's kind of why I, I started getting into baseball actually, because football football used to be my hobby uh, when I worked at the bank. But obviously, once it becomes your job, you do need something other than, or I need something other than football in my life. You know, I can't. I don't want to be uh, totally focusing on football uh, in my spare time if it's also my job. You know, I do need something else, which is why I, I sort of started following baseball and things like that. But I don't think it, I don't think it's taken any of the the joy out of it. I mean, I know certainly um, when I'm watching Liverpool games, I'm still very much involved in watching it and getting excited when the goals go in and all this sort of stuff. You know, I haven't I haven't lost that. So yeah. I think I, I think I've got the balance. I think I've got the balance pretty pretty well. Um, but as I say, I, I did also need to sort of start looking at other stuff in my spare time just so it wasn't you know just have something else to think about that isn't sort of my work now. You know. 
Yeah. I mean, that's also why um, when I'm doing like uh, my data science project uh, on the side, it's, it's on fantasy football and not directly like related to betting. It's also for like the yeah. same reason that I kind of want to have something that's kind of re kind of related, maybe useful in the future for for like my work. But for now, it's it's just for fun, and uh, and to learn something new at the same time, and uh, and that makes it enjoyable, and you get to sort of uh, disconnect a bit from from the work because uh, it is. Uh, I mean, we we run a, a small startup, so it is uh, a lot of work that has to go go into it to uh, to. Um, to make, keep things uh, things going as it as it is, and uh, yeah. yeah, it's nice to also yeah disconnect a little bit and uh, and uh, yeah spend the, the brain power a bit differently in the evenings. Yes, yeah, you have to. Right, um, yeah. So uh, let's uh, let's start to uh, we're getting closer to the end now. So um, I also believe we have a, a fellow acquaintance in in Professor David Sumter, uh, the author of uh, Soccer Maddox. Because uh, um, yeah, we we've been working a little bit on on David with uh, with some projects, and one time I was in checking the twelve bot website, I noticed that your name was uh, was on it. So what you what can you tell me about the the work you've been doing there with twelve bot? And for people who don't know what twelve bot is, maybe you can tell them what it is too. Well, yeah, twelve uh, is basically a uh, player analysis uh, site. Um, uh, which David has developed. Um, I suppose it's similar in a way to what we were talking about earlier with um, Ian Graham's work in that um, players are assigned values for actions they complete on the pitch and also where they are and um, if that action increases the value of uh, the chance of them scoring a goal. So again, you know, dribbles and passes closer to the opposition goal are worth more than dribbles and passes near your own goal and things like that. And so, yeah, it's basically a player analysis site. Um, my work really was just sort of writing articles and editing articles that other people had uh, had written and doing a bit of social media and things like that. So I, I've not had any involvement in um, how the, the their system is uh, sort of developed, um, but more just sort of, yeah, in the kind of media, um, media side of things, really. All right. That's uh, still cool to hear, and uh, you're doing what you're doing best, so I guess that makes uh, complete sense. Yeah. Moving on, uh, you have written a lot of articles related to both betting and football analysis over the years, so I'm very curious, do you place bets yourself? Um, I'm very much sort of like a, a, you know, a leisure gambler, just put sort of maybe a fiver on a match if I'm watching it, or... Uh, you know, a couple of games on the weekend or something like that. Nothing sort of sort of too serious. I guess I've always been more interested in the statistical analysis side of the game. And obviously doing that does enable me to write about betting because they obviously overlap a great deal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm very much a, a you know, small scale part time sort of gambler. Yeah. All right. Um, OK, so when when you are placing these bets, is it then based on uh, sort of your your hunches or what you're seeing then, or is it based on like the analysis that you have done uh, as part of your work? Yeah, I mean, it, it primarily be analysis based. Um, I've got a little sort of prediction model based on expected goals, mm -hmm. which I use to help me when I'm writing a preview of a match to say I think this will happen or that will happen. And then obviously, if there's a match, I just think I'll put a bet on. I'll check what that model thinks will. Happen against the odds are to see if there's any sort of interesting differences um, obviously uh, the model doesn't know about you know players being injured or having played a cup game two days earlier or any of these things but um, so I just thought sort of, yeah so I just sort of look at that and think oh is there any sort of you know value in what this is thinking will happen and what the bookmaker thinks will happen all right um, yeah and any other insights you can provide into sort of what other like inputs or or things you sort of crunch out of there is it mainly betting on like who is going to win the game or do you look into uh over unders or like uh, cards for that mayor matter or like player player props yeah because it's um goals based or expected goals based it's mainly the uh 1x2 market the both teams to score um over unders as you say it doesn't sort of have um 
player information and things like that in. When I'm looking at player information, I'm sort of looking at who's in form, but also who's had a lot of good chances recently and, and hasn't scored, so it might be due a goal, that sort of thing. Um, but the, the model that I use for my own little sort of bets is, is yeah, sort of goal-based uh, mark, team, goal-based markets. All right. Have you been uh, tracking the results? Do you have any idea whether it's uh, uh, profitable or uh, whether it's, uh, yeah? Um, not really. I mean, only in that I know that I don't have to top up my betting account, but it never has much money in either, you know, sort of win yeah. a few, lose a few, pretty standard. Um, I, as I say, it's more just for my own uh, entertainment than for any sort of serious financial gain or anything. Yeah, being able to sort of, I guess, test your, your wits and... Uh and yourself a yeah. bit against like the the bookies and, and seeing whether you can get like an edge over the market. All right. Exactly, yeah. Um if if you sort of had access to like any data or whatever, is there any any particular data that you would like to have but maybe it uh, doesn't exist, maybe it's too expensive. Uh so what what sort of data would you want to get your hands on if you were to like improve upon your betting model? Um I think it, it's difficult because there's obviously more data out there. I think for, for what I need, what I need it for, just to give it a sort of bit of an insight into predictions, I've, I've basically got what I need. I mean, in terms of, of data from a personal interest point of view, I'm more interested in sort of like historic stuff to see how good great teams from the past are because the data isn't sort of out there for, you know, the Arsenal Invincibles or the Man United treble winning team and all this sort of comparing them to now and see how good they were. That's the sort of thing that would sort of interest me. Mm. As I say, what what I need my model for, it's sort of, uh, it's it's basic, well, relatively basic, but it, it sort of serves its purpose. Yeah. I find it a bit, uh, I mean, it doesn't seem, uh, time flies by and I'm getting older uh, very fast, I think, but, but still, like, it doesn't seem too long away, uh, like the Arsenal Invincible side. So, it's it's a bit uh, crazy to me that uh, there's still like not that much data out there on those uh, those older leagues because I mean surely someone is sitting on the videos uh, from those leagues. I mean we're not talking 1950s or, or something like that and would I don't know benefit from uh, from like getting stats out of it. Yeah, well, I mean I think Opta um, will have the data. Um, on on certainly the invincibles, I think their shot data goes back to about 2003 or something like that. So they might not have the the Man United team from '99, but they might have that. But um, it's more when you're sort of at the amateur end of it, rather than sort of paying for it. It's what sort of websites are sharing that yeah. data, and obviously they don't they don't share data going back that far. It probably exists with Opta. I could probably buy it if I had enough money or whatever. Yeah. But um, just for sort of casual interest stuff, you want it to appear on a on a website, or whatever, and uh, and it doesn't go back that far. But, yeah, yeah, and, it's uh, out there somewhere. <laughs> and Opta and those sort of sites are, of course, very expensive. Um, so yeah, so one of the things that I that I am curious about then is because obviously you spend a lot of your time digging into data about football, and you spend some time like betting a bit for for fun, but yep. at least. Um, there are three main ways that I know of that are sort of like proven mathematical ways of, of beating bookmakers. And the first is match betting, where you're essentially exploiting like sign up uh, offers that you get from bookmakers and free bets to place bets on both sides of the game. So regardless of the result, you don't win any money, you don't lose any money, but you manage to cash out the bonus. Then there's arbitrage betting, where you place a bet on all sides of the game and you make a small profit regardless of the outcome, using uh, prices at different bookmakers. And then there is value betting, like we focus on, on trade made sports, where we're essentially looking for outliers in the markets on only one side of the game. So we're perfectly fine with backing, let's say, Liverpool to win against Manchester City at home, if the odds we're getting is 2% too high compared to where we consider the true true odds and true price to be. Uh, so I'm, I'm very curious as to uh, why someone with with your background hasn't like uh, yeah I know tried uh, like match betting or arbitrage betting, rally betting, or may, maybe you have, but uh, but yeah, wh why aren't you are doing it? No, I don't know. Maybe I should really. I mean, obviously, there's a little bit of I suppose elements of value betting in what I was talking about earlier, sort of looking at the the model versus the bookmaker prices. Um, but I haven't really tried the other ones. No, I mean, I, I sometimes take advantage of the free offers, but then just 
got a bit on with it, you know, nothing too sort of uh, strategic about it. So um, you're right, I probably should. Especially, well, I say at the moment, there's no sport to bet on, or very yeah. little. So uh, maybe once it all starts up again, I'll have a look at it. Yeah, I mean, uh, at least yesterday, the Belarusian Premier League was uh, scheduled to be played this weekend. I don't know if that's changed. But uh, right. but yeah, we uh, we gave some uh, predictions for uh, for CBS for uh, for the Belarusian uh, Premier League. So that's all I okay, know. Okay, there was running. football on in Australia. I think they had on um, BT Sport in the UK was showing football from Australia this morning. So yeah. there are little bits out there, but not very much. Yeah, no, because it's kind of like we spend a lot of our time writing articles, making videos, and everything just to educate people um, because. It just surprises me so much when there are like actual proven like ways you can beat the bookies. Why so few people take sort of the time to do a bit of Google searching? Because it isn't like it's not the easiest thing to find. Maybe you need to know a bit about what you're looking for, but it's it's not the hardest thing to find either. And uh, and yeah, I just find it uh, find it yeah fascinating that not more people like know about it and and actually like try it because. Yeah. E even if you are, in the end, uh, don't want to be too serious about it, or uh, I mean, people always need a bit extra cash, and uh, that's always nice. And even if one is like betting just casually, I at least still prefer winning uh, over over losing. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you have like any particularly like biggest uh, winning or losing bet? Anything that sticks out? Um, biggest winning bet was probably actually on um, horse racing, um, the Grand National. Uh, the winner, a uh, horse called Papillon, won. It was 33 to 1, mm -hmm. and I was, uh, I was on that. Uh, that's probably the best one. I mean, the biggest, I've really never really had a big loss because I've never bet, you know, huge amounts, nothing more than probably 20 pounds or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I think... Um, yeah, probably nothing major, and and but equally nothing sort of majorly big wins either. More often than not, it's just keeping the account topped up so I can just sort of keep playing along, or whatever. Yeah. Um, all right. So, what was sort of the the reason for why you you backed that uh, particular horse? I can't honestly remember because it was in it's probably in about the year two thousand. All right. <laughs> but um, my my dad is uh, very keen on horse racing, so he probably told me it was going to win or something like that. Yeah. Um, he he follows it uh, religiously, so I would imagine he probably knew something about it. All right. Um, have you learned any like lessons from either like betting yourself or from writing articles about betting that uh, yeah you could uh, could share with people? Um, I mean, I suppose the main one is it does seem like nobody ever wins long term. I mean, I'm sure some people do, but I think it's incredibly difficult to, to sort of win repeatedly. Um, there's a good guy to follow on Twitter called uh, Joseph Bookdahl yeah. uh, at one two expert. And um, he does a lot about um, sort of exposing people who claim they win all the time. And he's sort of like, well, you know show me the proof and they can never show the evidence and all these sorts of things. I think there's, I think there's a lot of traps to fall into if you're sort of looking for get rich quick on sort of betting. I think there's various people who could possibly take advantage of that. And he's quite good because he sort of cuts through all the, all the nonsense on that. So um, I suppose that's the main thing. I think, you know, I think look, my way of doing it is, is, is probably for the best for most people in that it's just a bit of fun and, you know, uh, don't sort of bet more than I can afford to lose, and that sort of thing. And it, I think, it, yeah, it is. It is very difficult to, to sort of make continual uh, big wins on, well, certainly on football anyway, which is my main sort of interest. Yeah. All right. Uh, we are actually um, having Bushdal on uh, this podcast. Okay. Yeah, I I know him from uh, from earlier. We've been uh, chatting with him over the years, uh, so he's going to be on in a couple of weeks. So that's going to be nice. I, Originally, we we're planning on heading over to the UK, but uh, that's a bit, uh, yes. a bit tricky these days. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, no, um, his work is great, and so his main, like, uh, I guess, model or theory is the wisdom of the crowds model, and that is basically the exact same principle that we are exploiting in Trainmate. Um, so it's all about finding, uh, like he's, I guess he's using pinnacle in his, uh, in his example and comparing 
what would happen if you managed to get uh, to bet on odds which beat the pinnacle closing lines and that's sort of uh, what we're all about too and everything we do is measured against the closing lines to see uh, that you do have like a positive expected value in the long run uh, because you need to have that and otherwise you are not going to be able to to beat the house uh, and it's it's exactly the same principle and that's behind why casinos always win in the long run is because they have an edge or a positive expected value against the players uh, so what we're all about is finding those bets those situations where something happened in the market players got injured uh, lineup changed things like that where there are bookies which are too slow to react to the new information and then like deviations yeah. occur in the markets and um, so yeah that's uh, that's at least what at least what we focus on and it's uh, many similarities to uh, to what Bushdahl is doing i also quite like yeah. his uh, his work on tipsters um because like if you have 10,000 uh, let's say uh, monkeys uh, making predictions <laughs> on football games then some of those monkeys are going to get lucky even like over let's say a thousand bets and win money just out of yeah. pure randomness uh, so there's like a huge survivorship bias out there and although there might be some tipsters who are able to beat uh, let's say the Czech uh, Premier League because they have some very good insight there it's extremely difficult to determine whether their profits are a result of luck or ability and yeah. he's done some great work on like quantifying all of that so highly recommend uh, to check that out definitely yeah so what's the most uh, i mean yeah what's the most common like mistake you see with people and uh, and betting um i suppose it's probably well it's either people perhaps not doing their research or you know looking into things a bit more sort of deeply beyond surface level I think as well, you get a lot of, um, what would you call them, patriotic betters, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, so I know the Euros aren't happening this summer, but you would get a lot of people betting on England to win the Euros. Um, and obviously they could, but realistically, they, they probably wouldn't. And um, I think I think that's where a lot of money probably gets thrown away on, on bets like that. Mm. Yeah, I uh, have bet against Liverpool on multiple occasions, or basically any time I see... Uh, an edge on the team Liverpool is playing against, then I'm very happy to to take that, even though I'm betting uh, against my own team. So it's like one needs to to leave the emotions out of it. That's uh, 100% sure. Yeah, definitely. All right. Yeah. Any any other advice or, or things you would like to to tell people? It can also be to not bet at all. That's totally fine. Uh, <laughs> it's a valid valid opinion to have. But yeah, just anything else to add. Well, I wouldn't say not bad at all because I, I, I get enjoyment from it. Um, but yeah, I mean, obviously, I think, you know, for sort of amateur betters or sort of leisure betters like myself, it's important to remember, as we've sort of said, the bookmaker always wins, else they wouldn't sort of exist. So it's just to sort of be, um, be kind of smart about it um, and, you know, not getting over your head. But I, I realise that does happen to people and it's not good. But um, yeah, I think um, just try and treat it as a sort of as a leisure thing and then uh you know it can be fun sort of pastime all right wise words wise words so if people want to see more of your work where can they find it and if they want to get in touch with you to uh, get some uh, business done what's the best way to to get a hold of you uh yeah well i'm on uh twitter i'm very active on there um at base tune to red and uh, there's a my pinned tweet has a link to my um, portfolio of uh, examples of my work and stuff like that. And uh, my email address is on there as well. So um, if they just search for Andrew Beasley on uh, on Twitter, they should be able to find me. I think yeah. All right, that's cool. And uh, that also makes me interesting. Do you actually play the bass then? I do. Yes. Um, I don't know if you'll see on the wall over there. <laughs> All right couple of guitars hanging up yeah. um yeah i do yeah and um it's uh there's a, i don't know if you're familiar with a band called super furry animals uh no, they had okay. they had a song called bass tuned to dead so i just changed it to bass tuned to red for obviously for liverpool uh right. so that's where that came from but yeah. i mean it, you know with hindsight it doesn't make any sense and i should, probably should 
I've just used my name, but you know, it is what it is. I don't mind. It's good. I like it's a it. Bit different. So uh, yeah, that, that's why uh, that's why I've got that. Yeah, it's also good to see that you're living up to your uh, your nickname then. So yes, uh, exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Being able to combine two passions in one nickname, I think that's pretty. Yeah, good exactly. Too, so. Thanks a lot for for taking the time to do this. Really appreciate no it. Had a lot of fun uh, talking with you. Uh, so I hope uh, I hope people will enjoy listening to it as well.